This week is episode 420. That's right, episode 420. We interview Byron Cleary to talk about virtualized honey nets. The ever so dreamy Trey Ford joins us in studio. We've got a whole bunch of security news to talk about, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails they flow steady. It's Paul Security Weekly. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the community edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. If you are listening to this show, check out the following two positions, both technical and both are work from home. Nessus Vulnerability Research Engineer and C Software Engineer. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet, because here's your host, a man who on the show of all shows asks, can this get higher? Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, <laughs> to episode 420, Dude. or episode 420. Dude. 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 <laughs> That's right. It's May 28th, and we're at episode 420. For uh, this Thursday <laughs> evening, it's just, apparently there's someone smoking a bong in the background <laughs> of the show. It's not a bong. It's a water pipe. It's, it's a, a water, water pipe. pipe filled with tobacco is yeah. what it is. I, yeah, I suspect, is. I suspect they're inhaling tobacco. It's very bad yeah. for you. Yeah. It's very bad for you. <laughs> Are you ready to learn combat firmware analysis, register for my Black Hat course, embedded device security assessments, a two-day hosted class at Black Hat? Las Vegas registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. It's very soon the price will go up. So now is the time to register. Mr. Santar, Cangelo, myself, and John Strand doing a webcast series titled Cracking the Code, How Security Nerds Become IT Leaders. Part one, titled From Penetration Testing Results to Improvement, will be held June 10th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. You can get all the details at securityweekly.com forward slash cracking the code. Any, any other ones, Paul, like Sans? Uh, in the next couple of segments, yes. Really? Yes. In the next segment. There is one. Oh yeah! Hey, how about that? <laughs> Never mind. I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> 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 Mr. Joff Thire is here in studio. No. I am. Good day, everybody. In Welcome, studio. Joff. In, in the G unit. Wait, wait, wait. You're Good inside. Day, love. Yeah, yes. can, I, can I love how can I, I love? <laughs> yeah, no. That's how Joff gets every woman that we interacted with in Boston to hug him. Okay, first of all, big shout out to my wife who's watching the stream this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, but, I meant uh, that was to hug Nick is what I was saying. That's right. Yes, and I did hug, hug Nick, Nick. And it was yes. good to see Nick. Yes. E. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mr. Larry Pesci is here yes, in studio. Amazingly, finally, for after how many it's weeks? It's been a long time. Oh. Yes. Yeah. On yeah. the lines via Skype, we've got uh, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. What? Look at that. I'm saying it right. What? Yeah, man. I'm, I'm thrown off by that. I had to look so around. Much, sure so much practice. Me. Mr. Not Kevin is that with us. That was the water pipe talking. Cheers. Uh, I, thought was, I thought it was Santa Calangelo. <laughs> no? Yeah, <that> is. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> That's if he's doing Shakespeare, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were just in Boston at Source Boston, which is pretty we fun. We were. Um, and Kevin's in Boston, and now we're here. So we missed each other, Kevin. What happened? Uh, time. Time, time is impressive. It's, it's a construct like, that like work kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's a thing. It's a yeah. building. You have to go into it, and then and sometimes like you work. leave. Yeah, you have yeah. to go into it and browse the web, and <laughs> yeah, always someone's <laughs> got to do it. It's important. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Larry. We've got um, attribution yeah. dice. <laughs> yes. So well, tell uh, us about we, these. You know, we were talking about attribution dice, and uh, Chris mentioned it, and potentially putting some together. But uh, one of our faithful listeners. Uh, Ian Meyer, uh, Rodian, and said, Paul, Larry, and Jack, 
Please enjoy the enclosed attribution dice. I may make two additional dice soon uh, to roll for the what and the remediation, i.e. it was an APT from Russia and we will reorg IT. Mm. I also felt guilty for not making Joff, and I hope I'm saying his name right, Michael Sandar Kalanjikamanjikajello. Sorry, I couldn't, re- <laughs> couldn't resist. I wanted to make sure that the first batch came out okay before printing a bunch of them. Perhaps they will get the new dice when I make them. Thanks for putting together a great show. And yes, we have attribution dice. So who was it, Larry? Awesome. Who was it? Let who was it? Who hacked us? It was China. It was China. Who hacked you? Uh, 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 an insider. That's what she said. Who hacked you, Joff? Uh, I got North Korea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet <Nice>. my luck. <laughs> we settled that. Nice. <laughs> these are awesome. These, these are I'm awesome. I'm going to cherish this forever. This is great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, thanks. And if you are going to make another one, I, I, I would love to have one. They look, they look really cool. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, those are those, the, the, the awesome. Awesome. I, CIA, you know, wait. <laughs> you I kind of think maybe instead of the wild card, one needs to say Bob. Okay. Well, that could, that could be your wild card. If whenever Bob. it says wild, when you just say wild Bob. Says Bob. I, I said ISIS earlier. I mean, I got the NSA that time. <laughs> <laughs> That's or they got you. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Script Kitty. <laughs> Our feature interview for the show <laughs> is with Byron Cleary, a field engineering manager at Ativo Networks. Ativo is the leader in information security with proactive solutions for post-infection breach data. They're using a patented virtual honey net technology uh, Byron has over 15 years experience working in security. Byron, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So, Byron, how did you get your start in information security? You know, I came from the network side of the house. Um, you know, going all the way back, talking MCI and dial-up. Mm-hmm. And with that, um, moved on to AT&T. And at AT&T is where we were building really nice big networks. But we never really considered security. It was all about speed and feed. And that was the next logical step is now we've built these big, fast networks. How do we secure them? Um, so, Byron, how did you come to, to work for uh, Ativo Networks? And tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what your role is there. Yeah, so my role here is field engineering manager. Um, and the way I really came about working here at Ativo was... Perimeter security, working with Fortinet, working with all these Palo Alto firewall technologies, we always had a lot of mystery if it did not go through our physical interface. So something that Ativo does very well is we've designed a technology that gives you visibility into that east-west traffic, that lateral propagation. Uh, So if it does not go through that firewall interface to inspect it, we still have visibility if it is on that local segment. So what's a, what's a virtualized honey net? So what we do is we take, our, we take VMs, which are full licensed versions, and then we create virtualized instances of those through virtual interfaces, and we can distribute the network. Uh, so you can do you know, static configurations. You can do it through VLAN trunking. But we create these engagement server instances within the network that are running services that are fairly vulnerable and fundamentally should never be talked to. So if somebody talks to them, they're uh, either very curious, misconfigured, or nefarious. So when you say they're they're vulnerable, like what uh, is it like missing Windows patches or like what kind of vulnerabilities are? Yeah. So for example, we'll uh, we'll have like Ubuntu twelve four and We'll leave it open to shell shock. We'll have it completely, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily patch them. Uh, we don't keep them up to the current patch levels. Um, but we don't let them look so old that it's obvious with that. So, so you would put like a trunk port into uh, your system so that you can have these virtualized honeypots on basically any VLAN within your internal network? That is, that is correct. That's one That's deployment. Interesting. Yeah. And, and the only thing on these, uh, the virtualized system is vulnerable systems. So if someone compromises it, they're not going to get, they won't be able to break out of the sandbox conceivably. And that's kind of what, you know, we, we all played with Honeypot over the past decade. And the biggest challenge with Honeypot is we go, we build this great system, and then somebody compromises it. And we didn't really have a way to rebuild that system quickly to get mm-hmm. it back 
to a vulnerable state. So what we've done is we basically, you know, the way Snore and Marty, the way they ran that with that, and then suddenly it got commercialized and got a little bit easier with Sourcefire. We're doing a similar thing with Honeypot, which is we feel like it's a great technology, and we've commercialized that, and we've kind of put some other things in there that make it really easy so that we have the vulnerability out there. We want them to be compromised. Once they're compromised, we have all that forensic information. That's the value to us and our customers. And then we simply just hit one button, one click, rebuild, and we're back to zero, ready to get attacked again. Now, you're not nuking the attacker's IP, right? So if it's like someone breaks in your honeypot, you're not, it's not like active defense type stuff where the person attacking the honeypot uh, re receives anything that would impede them, right? You're just kind of letting them hack and using it as, like you said, forensics or information gathering. Yeah, and that's correct. And like, like I said, we, we understand, you know, a lot of our background here at Ativo comes from Akathy, comes from Fortinet, comes from Palo Alto. So we understand that those technologies do a very good job at what they're doing. So we decided we're not going to try to develop a replacement technology. What we want to effectively provide something that isn't currently available. So we work in conjunction with the firewalls. We work in conjunction with the other perimeter defenses. We're just going into the east-west traffic and trying to give you some protection there. So where do you send the data once you've, like, let's say you have an Ubuntu system and you find someone has exploited the shell shock vulnerability, where do you, so like, how do you collect that information, where do you send it, and what do people do with it? Yeah, so we have, uh, on our physical appliance, we'll have that data local, and we can export it, so if you want to use any, uh, like, Mandiant's IOC editor, we can do an IOC export for that, we can do sticks, we also have CSV and PCAP, so if you want to pull in the Wireshark and you want to do some off-box forensics and so that's the packet capture piece that's the full details but we also have direct integration uh, you can do any you know UDP 514 syslog if you want to integrate it with your syslog server or we have as well uh, we have an IP uh, API built into Splunk so you know theoretically we want to be able to send the alerts off the box but then have the forensic data stored locally on the box it's interesting. So um, how do you prevent regular users from stumbling upon these virtual honeypots by accident? Uh, we're not trying to prevent that. That's good information. And what we do is we have different threat levels. Um, we have different severity levels. So if somebody accidentally comes by and you know does a little ping sweep across the network, that's such a low severity thing. And it doesn't really correlate with any other actions. But if we see a slow and low coming through from ICMP, and then that same source address has a TCP SYN packet going for a specific port, and then we see a connection on that specific port with a failed logon, and then we get a successful logon. So that's where our uh, correlation engine, and there's the logic built into that in terms of what events we are seeing. Mm, cool. Joff, what do you think about uh, coming across this on the penetration test? I, I, think, it's, I think it's very interesting because, um, uh, first of all, uh, it's a potential distraction mm. on a penetration test. Uh, it could lead you down a path that, um, well, perhaps you don't want to go down. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's... Uh, no. No. Um, but, but the east-west as aspect I really like because um, traditional primitive stuff, um, as stated, uh, is uh, not doing the, the east-west... Um, traffic any any service so the fact that you're going for that I think is is a really really great thing now what do you do uh, in environments where they're uh, so highly segmented that you can't have like a single trunk uh, capture all the segments in the network to a single device you have distribute a sensor model of some sort that you use yeah so with these uh we have different tiers of them in physical appliances. We have some basic appliances that will have only six VMs running. And off those six VMs, you can create up to 32 per VM. So you can distribute up to 192 IPs on our base system. 
up to uh, 384 on our uh, larger um, BotSync 5000. And those are the physical appliances. But what we're seeing more commonly in the distributed environments is that there's a lot more virtualization. So we do have a VM version of this. And that's typically what we're going to be using those more distributed environments. Right, right. Do, do your, uh, you spoke about not going too old in terms of your, um, your, your virtualized honeypots that you're deploying. Are you, uh, with your customer engagements, are you looking at sort of mimicking their environment, having, uh, um, let's say, Windows 7 uh, close to what would be a production station and then having a few vulnerabilities rather than sort of deploying what I would look at if I was pen testing as sort of the obvious I'm in a largely, say, Windows 8, Windows, Windows 7 environment, and suddenly I come across Windows XP, I'd be like, huh, that's a little bit, uh, little bit weird. So, um, yeah, so hope my question makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, it does make sense. And so you have to think of two different areas. One is default settings. Default settings out of the box, we have CentOS 12.4 Ubuntu, 13.10 Ubuntu, uh, Win XP, Win 7, 2008 but we allow full customization. So you can actually repave all six of those VMs with your own images. If you are, like for example, in the healthcare industry, if you have a lot of, uh, you know, maybe some medical devices that are running, there's no value in Windows 7. So what we would do is we would recustomize the box for you, or you could customize it with your own images. So now you're running six instances of the XP. And what we can do on there is we can take those individual instances and we can actually rewrite the map based on the OUI, the vendor code, so that when somebody's looking for a specific medical device, they see that vendor code and they think, okay, this is the defibrillator running on XP that I have an exploit for. So we, we make full custom customization available to you. Um, but out of the box, running simple, running basic, uh, it's the CentOS 07, the 12.4 Ubuntu, you know, 13.10 Ubuntu, and the XP 7 in 2008 Windows. That's interesting. I, one more, one more follow-up. Uh, the in terms of a historical aspect, uh, you once you uh, you know capture that compromised data uh, from, from in, a, in a virtual honeypot, are you keeping uh, history with any kind of data analytics engine or anything similar to that 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 the uh, the customer can go back? and uh, search through compromise events over time? Yeah, so for example, let's say that if we have a host that becomes owned and what they do is they, uh, maybe there's a payload event, they do a binary file drop, they move something into a temporary directory. Well, we lock that down. We allow them to do everything they want, but we lock that down and we give you access so that you can now get that payload from that VM with that. And we also have sinkhole technology built into it. So if they try to move that payload and then initiate a CNC connection going outbound, we don't allow that CNC connection to go outbound. Anything that's natively sourced from that VM trying to go out, we automatically send to the sink. We also have another option, back to what I said earlier, is we're not a replacement technology. We really want to complement what's in place. So if you look at some of the sandboxing technologies, for example, that like to detonate malware, well, what we can do is we can actually enable a sinkhole proxy and we can connect it up to your sandbox. And now what happens is that malware will go out to your sandbox, be detonated, and we are watching the behavior of that from the CNC and the connection standpoint. And you can now correlate that data from both devices up at a higher level. Uh, it sounds, sounds very good. Uh, Larry, have you got any questions? I, I do not. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, obviously breaking into some potential other industries, have you guys explored any of the sort of ICS type of um, honeypot technologies as of late? No, we, we have not. Um, no, we haven't. Sorry, it's your only question. And I don't <laughs> no, no, I mean it's it's pretty cut and dry. You, you have or you haven't, and, that, and that's perfectly yeah. fine. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. I really didn't have a question, and that actually came into my mind last minute. So it's it's good that I actually found one. So awesome, Byron, <clears throat> are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Bum, bum, bum. I'm ready. What's the prize? 
Um, bragging rights. The, yeah, <laughs> bragging rights for yeah. being on Security Weekly and answering the five questions. Okay, ready? Three words to describe yourself. Um, That's one. Is a word. So, now I don't, um, I guess I'm not good off on the fly with this stuff. Three words to describe myself would be, I don't have it. That's three words. That's three words. If you were a serial Fair killer, enough. what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, it would probably be a Cat 5 cable. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? How to kill someone with a Cat 5 cable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it when guests chain the questions together. It's great. That's awesome. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? First. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. I'd have to go with Nick Nolte for good parenting advice. Oh, and, wow. Uh, let's see. I guess... Um, I guess... I don't really know. Can I have two dads? Since sure, I'm absolutely. absolutely. You know? it, is, yeah. it is California, after all. Yeah, let's go with... Uh, Let's go with Nick Nolte, and then um, I don't know. I guess you know what I'm what? from a single parent. Okay. Or you can go with Angelina Jolie, which is the most popular yeah, that's a answer for popular it. default <laughs> it answer. I, I felt like that was such a cliche one. It, it, it's well, the it most is. popular answer. So yeah. yep. apparently, a lot of people want Angelina Jolie to be their mom, it, which is I I approve. This message. Well, I, <laughs> I think it it means they've got some serious mental issues, but, but I still Could approve. <laughs> also, it means you have serious mental. Yeah, yeah. but uh, let's not talk about that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Byron, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. Have a good evening. You too. Tell Steve I said hi. We saw him at the source. Yeah, yeah we saw Steve at, at yes. source. So, he was yeah. right next next to us the whole time. All right, I'll do that. All righty. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Good. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, give my engineers enough time to actually play the music, otherwise they complain to me. <sighs> dun, 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 dun. Come back and bring Trey Ford and the lovely Jack Daniel on the show and find out what's in this fabulous cocktail that they gave me. Which so is we'll fabulous. be right back. Ooh, ooh. Mm. That is so They're good. laughing.